Good morning. My name is Anne Cruikshank and I am a GP in Oxfordshire. And in 2018, I was appointed as the RCGP clinical champion for Lyme disease. And I've had a long interest in Lyme disease, probably going back to about 2007. Um, my, the aim of working with the RCGP was to develop an educational project aimed at raising the profile of Lyme disease in primary care, because we know that early inadequate treatment provides the best chance of full recovery. Therefore, Lyme disease needs to be considered as a primary care illness because by the time they get to secondary care, they're really much, much more unwell. So I'm just going to share my screen now. So the project I've mentioned, um, we feel that the role of primary care is to raise patient awareness, ensure early diagnosis and treatment, um, ensure adequate coding within the GP records in that uh, it's not a notifiable disease and the only information being collated is that based on positive serology. And since there is now um, a push towards not requesting serology and just diagnosing EM rashes clinically, um, this information really is important to, to collect. So GPs also play a role in rec the recognition really of late Lyme disease in that Individual consultants may just be seeing individual cases where, uh, or individual system disease, whereas the GP may be the one person who can um, pick up on the multi-system issues. And also providing patient support because many of these patients don't recover or they're dismissed or they feel that there is some degree of stigma around Lyme disease and they really do need support. So one of the outcomes of the Spotlight Project was the Lyme Disease Toolkit. This is open access. It's available to clinicians as any clinicians as well as the general public. And our aim was to produce uh, one site where you could, we could collate as much information as possible. So we hope that you'll find it useful for links to in-depth information as well as um, immediate access within the consultation where you may be seeking uh, images of EM rashes or access to the guidelines uh, on, on treatment. There's also links here to patient support groups which can be extremely helpful for patients. So what is Lyme disease? It's a spirochete infection, uh, most common tick-borne disease in Europe and North America and it's transmitted by the bite of an infected tick. And this is the first question that we were asking today was what, when were the neurological manifestations of Borreliosis first recognized in Europe? And so yeah, in Europe, um, people became aware of the neurological uh, symptoms associated with tick bites back in the 1920s. So apparently, even though it appears that Lyme disease is a new illness, it's been recognized in Europe for quite some time, but only maybe in the 1970s were tick bites and rashes and neurological symptoms um, seem, to be, seem to be associated with each other. In fact, the name Lyme disease comes from the town of Old Lyme in Connecticut, where there was a cluster of juvenile rheumatoid arthritis cases, which the parents themselves picked up on uh, and then insisted on some investigation and it was subsequently found to be due to, to tick-borne infection. And back in 1988, Dr. Andrew Pashner described Lyme disease as the new great imitator. And the, uh, the original great imitator that he was comparing this with was syphilis, which of course was another spirochetal infection, which has an early phase, secondary phase and a tertiary phase and is known to cause multi-systemic illness. So Borrelia is a complex organism. The Borrelia burgdorferi sensulato complex is made up of a huge number of genus species, including Borrelia burgdorferi sensu stricto, which is most common in the USA, but also present in Europe, and Borrelia gorinii and Avzelii, which are the usual genus species found in Europe. There are also various other newer species which don't come up on the routine testing. 
And we think that the difference between the genus to species is what probably accounts for variations in the disease profile that we see in patients. We know that Borrelia was disseminated early in the can be disseminated early in the disease. It's got an affinity for collagen rich, rich tissues. It can cause immune dysfunction and it is able to evade the immune system. Laboratory testing is an area really of some disagreement. The standard testing is the two-tier Lyme serology testing with an ELISA and an immunoblot. And there are concerns about false positive results, which is the reason for the second part of the testing. But a false negative testing is probably much more of a concern. And this may occur because the testing is done too early, um, because the patient's only able to produce a weak immune response, or maybe because they've already had early antibiotics which may affect uh, the likelihood of ever seroconverting. And a, ne a negative test should not be used to exclude the diagnosis of Lyme disease. So, and this is what a lot of patients come up against. They have, they have symptoms, sometimes it's quite a clear history. Um, obviously there are a lot, some patients who feel that they probably have Lyme disease, but with no clear evidence for that. But, it is important to keep remembering a negative test does not exclude the diagnosis. The instance is increasing and this uh, diagram is just really showing laboratory confirmed cases in England and Wales. Um, but you can see from quite a steep rise between 2015 and 2017. Um, if you take into account the number of EM rushes uh, where, where there is no testing actually being done. The, the official suggestion is that there are about 3,000 cases a year, but some more recent research is suggesting probably at least three times that. Um, and we know that a significant number of these people never recover. So we know in England that it appears to be a higher incidence in the 45 to 64 years age group, and that the Southern counties and Scottish Highlands um, are much more high risk areas, although we do know that ticks are present throughout the UK. It's most likely the, the tick activity is highest between about March and September, but can occur at any time during the year. And you can see from this graph, the, de the demographic showing quite a significant uh, increase between the ages 45 and 65. There's also, um, a significant jump in, in children between aged about six and ten. And the big tick project was carried out in the UK a couple of years ago looking at the the risk from tick bites in the UK and showing a high increase in tick-borne infections in Scotland and the southwest of England in Norfolk. So ticks are blood-sucking um, creatures Keep losing my place here, hang on. Um, and the life cycle of ticks is what's relevant. They need to have two blood meals at minimum during their, their life cycle. And their choice would be normally that they're feeding on small mammals or birds. Uh, and these are the, the reservoir for infection. Um, and domestic animals and humans are really just a, an incidental host. Although we associate deer, I think, with ticks, what we do know is tick, deer may carry a lot of ticks, but they're not the reservoir for infection. The infection is coming from the smaller animals. So you don't need to be in an area where there are a lot of ticks, uh, sorry, a lot of deer. Um, and the size of the ticks is uh, much more difficult to, um, to notice the tick bite. Right. So sheep, sheep ticks, fox ticks, um, there are very diff various different types, and you can see there the, the variation in size. And the tick bites are painless, which is one of the reasons they go unnoticed. Um, many ticks are not infected, and the maximum percentage infection in, in certain areas of the country is probably no more than 16%. But we have no minimum time, but there's no proven minimum time for, for needed for attachment to, to transmit this infection. There's always been a bit of a misunderstanding that maybe it's 24, 48, 72 hours. 
but actually um, the, it, it may be much, much less than that. So the bites are painless. The, the ticks will normally attach in moist um, flexures in the skin, maybe the groin, the umbilicus under the arm and behind the ears. Um, and they can attach there for days and then suddenly fall off uh, again without ever being noticed. And although a large tick probably will be noticed, the small ones could easily be missed. And most people are aware they're probably found in woods, heaths, long grass, but they're also present in parks, in people's gardens, because again, they're carried through on the birds and the small mammals. So even parks in the middle of London um, are, are potentially risk areas for, for picking up ticks. And children are probably bitten above the waist, which is why parents need to really be thorough when they're checking, to, checking their children, especially the areas like under the hairline where they could easily be missed. Adults probably more likely on the arms and legs. And prevention really is going to be better than cure. We know how easy it is to miss this disease. So providing ed public ed education really is vital. And the advice is to be wearing shoes, to tuck trousers into socks, to be wearing lighter colored clothes so that um, there's less chance of the ticks getting onto the skin. Obviously also using insect repellents and doing tick checks on yourself, on children, on domestic animals. Okay, so next question, please. Which of the following methods, there's five options there, is recommended for removing ticks? Okay, so um, first option was blunt nose tweezers. Now, potentially you could use those, but they're not ideal. Really, you would want very fine tipped um, tweezers because if you crush the tick, you risk it being stressed and regurgitating its contents back into the host. Don't cover it in oil, don't uh, use fingers in that that will again, potentially just crush the, the tick. So the answer is actually none of the above are re really recommended. Um, if all else fails, then the wider tweezers will be okay, but ideally not. So the idea, preferably use a tick remover or fine tooth tweezers and don't. Uh, the other option is, is a credit card, a slit in a credit card. So this will just give you an idea of um, how a tick twi twister is used. So the idea is that with a tick twister, it's easier to rotate, not because the tick has a corkscrew head, but just because it has, um, it's like a brush effect in the, the mouthpiece and it would be easier to twist. But if you're using ordinary, force, uh, ordinary tweezers, just pull straight out um, gently, firmly. But with a tick twister, you, you need to twist. And it doesn't matter whether it's clockwise, anti-clockwise makes no difference. Okay, so looking at stages of Lyme disease, um, we can describe them into early localized, early disseminated, late disseminated, and then the persistent symptoms. And a lot of different names are used for this um, issue of persistent symptoms. As Professor Lambert mentioned earlier, some people would call it chronic Lyme disease. Some people call it post-treatment Lyme disease. Um, the issue there is whether they're trying to suggest that post-treatment means post-infectious. Uh, uh, and the argument is that um, there's no evidence that it's post-infectious because we know that the, the bug can persist following antibiotic treatment. So this is really how people might present in primary care. They might come to ask you to remove a tick um, whether that's to the pharmacy or to the GP or to the nurse. And it's important to know how to do that. Um, 
we have had lots of reports of people being sent away from their GP because no one knew what to do. And so they, they went down to the local vet to um, remove the tick for them. They may come in with the EM rash um, and it might be classic, it might be so obvious, but it's just as likely to be an odd confluent red rash, which could easily be mistaken for something else. They might come in having had a tick bite and they're very anxious and they're very worried and they're insisting on a blood test uh, or they're insisting on antibiotics and you need to, to have the, the knowledge and the confidence to, to reassure them or to, to treat as necessary if, if that was indicated. If they're coming in and they're aware of a tick bite um, and they've got a rash or they're feeling unwell, then it's important to, to go into that in detail, make a decision on treatment but they may not mention the rash, they may not have noticed it, or they may um, have not even noticed the tick bite or forgotten about it. They've just come in unwell in the middle of summer and it really needs to be on the ra your radar to, to think about that. Um, they might, as Jack mentioned, be at a, a stage of having chronic multi-systemic illness. And it might be a patient who's never been ill before until a couple of years when you look back uh, and everything developed over a short period of time. They might have been diagnosed previously with chronic fatigue, but have they ever had a Lyme test or has anyone ever looked at that possibility? They might have had Lyme disease in the past and apparently been well and now presenting with new symptoms. So if they do have a tick bite, um, it's important to record that in the notes. Um, it's important if they're seen at the pharmacy that they, they do then present and remember that they need to mention that to a GP in the future. Um, again, it's probably unlikely that they've picked up an infection since the infection rate is low, but record where they were. Were they in America? Were they in Eastern Europe? Um, how long the tick was probably attached for? Um, how it was removed? Was it a traumatic removal or was it done carefully? Um, was there more than one tick? Are there any rashes or flu-like symptoms? And just give them some background information on Lyme disease so that if they become unwell or notice a rash, they should come back. There might be indications to do a test uh, depending on uh, how long previously the tick bite was. Um, uh, in general, we don't recommend prophylactic treatment, but there might be some cases um, where if a patient had previously had Lyme disease, was very, very anxious, or uh, we've heard of cases where children have had maybe 25 uh, nymph ticks removed um, and there's a really a high likelihood in that case that they, they could well develop an infection um, and if there's a clinical suspicion of Lyme the advice is to, to treat and I will come to that. So these are going to be the early symptoms just very non-specific really. Neck ache seems to be uh, not uncommon. Um, I have come across people dismissing Lyme disease on the basis that, well, they've got what looks like an erythema migans rash, but they're not ill. So therefore it can't be Lyme. Well, that's the issue. It can be just the rash and nothing else. And you treat the rash, it's diagnostic. So it usually occurs three to 30 days after a tick bite, but it could be several months later. It's usually painless. It's not hot, it's not itchy. It can be just an atypical confluent red mark, which could just as easily look like cellulitis or an allergy or ringworm. And the history is key um, because patients make assumptions. They have a rash that developed yesterday. So they come in to tell you they got bitten yesterday, whereas they actually weren't outside yesterday. And if you go into the history, it was two weeks ago when they were camping in the Lake District or something like that. So don't go on patients' uh, assumptions. And if they come to tell you that they had the rash now gone away by the time they get their appointment, that does not mean the infection has resolved. They do still need treatment. And remember, as I said, they may present to the nurse rather than the pharmacist. So a nurse rather than the GP, especially, uh, and even more likely maybe the pharmacist at the moment with the COVID situation. So a rash like that would be classic and it probably would be difficult to miss. It tends to be at least five centimeters diameter and may keep expanding over time. 
Um, it's not necessarily at the site of the tick bite. It could be a very large rash, um, which is you know really quite atypical. You could even get multiple erythema migraines. And they could appear to be coming and going, fading at times and then looking darker at others. And they might be there for a short time. They might persist for weeks or months. So early disseminated Lyme disease. People start to develop more di diverse symptoms. And facial palsy, which I think a lot of people aren't aware of, is a potential early symptom of Lyme disease. And if you see a patient with facial palsy, it is important to, to look at that history. Is there anything else that would make you concerned that this was Lyme disease? And it's a difficult balance because if you don't treat with prednisolone, you could potentially be crit criticized. But if you treat a Lyme disease facial palsy with prednisolone only, there's a significant chance it won't fully recover. Um, and my only thought there is that potentially you would need to, to consider both options if you weren't sure whilst arranging um, a test uh, to actually give antibiotics and steroids and discuss the whole issue with the patient. So other symptoms would be palpitations, maybe shortness of breath, anxiety, quite significant brain fog or other unusual neuropathies. Um, there are cases where patients are diagnosed with meningitis, but because the lumbar puncture um, doesn't grow a standard bacteria, it's assumed to be vi a viral uh, cause. And maybe they've had one or two doses of IV antibiotics and then discharged from hospital with a partially treated Lyme meningitis, which develops significant long-term complications. Anxiety seems to be a symptom of the disease. So it's not just the patients are anxious because they're upset, they're anxious because no one's believing them. It is seem, does seem to be a part of the inflammatory process of the disease. And these are the kind of symptoms that you might get weeks or months down the line. Um, myalgias and arthralgias are often migratory. They're coming and going one day for a day or so, and then they move to a different different part of the body and patients are sometimes embarrassed to tell you about that because it doesn't seem to make any sense um, and that they're, they're embarrassed to to explain I've had patients to tell me well I, I didn't really want to tell you that because I thought you'd think I was mad um, so uh, it, it is important to, to listen to what they're saying um, hyperacusis is something that that patients will often describe as well uh, and it may uh, have very similar symptoms to other or uh, other uh, conditions such as POTS, postural tachycardic syndrome. Um, now, one of these the, the points about these kind of symptoms is that they're also very similar to the kind of things that would, people are describing in long COVID. Uh, and one of the the things that I think we are aware of is that. A year ago, last spring, a lot of patients may have developed unusual symptoms, which were assumed to be COVID because there was no COVID testing available at the time. They didn't have the severe COVID, but they had low grade symptoms that have persisted. And some of your patients no. could potentially, or assume to have long COVID, could potentially have, uh, uh, have Lyme disease. So if you've got patients who aren't getting better, maybe go back and investigate whether that could be a possibility. Pediatric Lyme disease can be more difficult. Patients are often, uh, young children are just unhappy, they're tearful, they don't want to play, they're tired all the time, they've got aches and pains. Older teenagers might just become more difficult and disruptive. Um, and that could delay the diagnosis quite significantly. So, I think probably this is an obvious question, but should we be considering Lyme disease um, in patients with chronic fatigue? Yeah. So I think everyone's really coming up with the same answer there. So if you've got those, those patients, maybe you've had chronic fatigue for years, 
And it doesn't mean that you can instantly fix it with a short course of antibiotics, but it's something to be considered based on history um, and potential tick exposure. Um, obviously, you don't want your patients to, to, to become uh, incorrectly assuming that they've got Lyme disease, but it's something to actually broach with them and think about. And this is why we call it the new great imitator, because there have been cases of, of all of these types of symptoms being diagnosed or misdiagnosed with these symptoms and subsequently found to have Lyme disease. I personally have uh, a colleague in the States who was diagnosed with motor neuron disease 15 years ago by four separate neurologists, a very eminent neurologist. He was wheelchair bound at the time his family, because he was a, a clinician himself, um, he was subsequently found to have Lyme disease and treated with intravenous antibiotics um, and got back to about 80% of normal function. And that was 15 years ago. Um, so it is important to uh, be aware of how this disease could present. So you're not going to diagnose it if it's not on your radar. And that's really what uh, I think we want to get across today. If it's on your radar, if you've even vaguely thought about it, it might it might jump out at you when it does present. And the NICE guideline in terms of treatment, um, the NICE guideline uh, covers the UK. It doesn't. It, I, I know there isn't a specific guideline for Ireland, but. Um, I think it's it's probably as good as we've got at the moment, but it really only refers to um, early Lyme disease and it is based on very limited um, data. But the rash is diagnostic, you don't need a test, which is why it's really important to, to then record that correctly in the, in the records. The guideline also says that you can treat based on clinical suspicion. So, um, rather than wait for tests to come back or even if tests are negative, if the history is suggestive, you can discuss that with the patient and decide on whether to treat. They advise a minimum 21 days of treatment um, and that review it, they advise review at three weeks and if patients are still symptomatic to use uh, another three weeks of a different antibiotic. They don't then tell you what to do after that when no one has, uh, when a patient, if a patient hasn't recovered. They do confirm that a negative test doesn't exclude the diagnosis. Um, and the, the difficulty is that there are no recommendations on what to do with these chronically ill patients. Um, a patient, somebody like Dr. Professor Lambert is obviously seeing a lot of these patients, but there are no NHS clinics and no plans to set up any NHS clinics at the moment. So if you're going to arrange any testing, um, patients um, report that they go to the GP who tells them they don't know how to organize the test and sends them away to come back a few weeks later. Um, it's not difficult. The test should be on your on the ICE system um, under Borrelia. It won't say Lyme disease, it'll probably say Borrelia. And you just send the test to the local laboratory. But if you've got a strong feeling that this is Lyme disease, it's worth downloading the form from uh, the toolkit, which is, there's one for Scotland on there, one for the UK. And I think you may use the, the UK one in Ireland as well, because it goes to Port and Down, um, which just gives you an option to write some more details in, which might be helpful in the diagnosis uh, for the laboratory itself. The first test, the ELISA is back in 24 hours. The, if it gets sent for the line block, that can take up weeks. And then if a patient hasn't got well, you might think about requesting, speaking to the lab and requesting co-infection testing. If you go back to the NICE guideline, um, what it advises is treat an EM rash. If there isn't an EM rash to arrange a blood test. But if you wait for a test, if a patient is acutely ill and you wait another two weeks to get a result back, you are really running the risk of um, treatment failure in the longer term. So 
Although the guideline suggests waiting for that result, it does give you this option, as I mentioned before, of treating based on clinical suspicion. So even if you're doing the test, you can instigate treatment. Obviously, if they've been ill for months, then it's fine to, um, to wait a week or so for, for the test. But again, it doesn't, a negative test isn't exclusive. Um, and you can contact the Lyme Lab directly if you need to, to get information. So um, I don't expect you to be able to read all this. You can link to it easily either by Googling the NICE guideline or by looking at the toolkit. Again, the main thing is early treatment um, and a minimum three weeks just to start with. Children under 12, the advice is to speak to a paediatrician unless uh, it's a very straightforward um, minor symptoms. Okay, so adults, first line is doxycycline, 100 milligrams twice a day for 21 days, or amoxicillin, or azithromycin. You should warn patients about the yarix herxheimer reaction. Um, this is a reaction to um, the killing off of spirochetes, which can cause quite a severe exacerbation of, of the, the, the symptoms that are already present. Now, the guideline says that it occurs within the first, first 24 hours, but our experience with Lyme disease is it's probably in the first five days. Um, as I said, if, the reason to use doxycycline rather than amoxicillin is because it um, will cover more of the co-infections if they're only present. Um, but remembering the issue of sun sensitivity, which seems to be dose dependent, I think, in a lot of patients. So just being aware of that in the summer months. Um, and obviously, if patients are really significantly unwell, they need to be uh, referred into hospital as they may need IV antibiotics, keftrioxone usually. So in treat, uh, children, the guideline suggests um, children aged nine to 12 should have doxycycline specific, although we wouldn't use it in many other cases, you would use it uh, for Lyme disease. Otherwise it's amoxicillin, but it's really quite a high dose if you look at that 30 milligrams per kilogram, three times a day. Um, and again, if you look at the guideline, there are different dosages depending on the severity of symptoms and IV antibiotics might be needed. So if you want specialist advice, go to the Lyme labs or local consultants, but there are no specialist clinics. And my advice or my own experience is that most hospital clinicians have no, are not uh, more experienced at Lyme, treating Lyme disease than you are. Um, they don't have any more um, uh, insight in many cases into the issues. There are some other guidelines, ILADS, um, again, you can link to that in the toolkit. They're suggesting much longer courses of treatment and treat until people are well. There's European Centre for Disease Control. And there's the Infectious Diseases Society of America, which has pretty limited guidelines and really refutes the evidence for treating for longer periods. And then you've got to think about why patients have got these persistent symptoms. Um, treatment failure might be due to just persistent infection. Maybe they didn't take the antibiotics, maybe they've been reinfected. Think about other non-Lyme causes, B12 deficiency, hypothyroidism, be sure there's no malignancy. So just because a patient thinks they might have Lyme disease, you need to, to really look at other options. And again, as I mentioned, this overlap now with, with COVID, uh, is long COVID, is there any possibility in some cases it's actually undiagnosed Lyme disease. Persistent symptoms are really are significant. We know there's about 300,000 new cases of Lyme in the USA per year. And they've extrapolated the to suggest there are now 2 million um, people with persistent symptoms. And although they can't show the objective evidence that it's symptomatically, these people are very unwell. So the key points are that it's a complex disease Testing might be unreliable and early adequate treatment is, is the key. Uh, and Medical Defense Union has actually warned that if we miss this, uh, there is potential for medical, li medical legal liability. So we do need to be aware of that. The EMRASH is diagnostic. They don't need to be unwell otherwise. If unusual, think about Lyme, 
um, and if the patient thinks suggests I'm taking them seriously. And my advice or suggestion is think about developing a Lyme aware practice so that everybody's on the same page. Otherwise you'll get patients where one doctor tells them to come back, another doctor tells them that Lyme disease doesn't exist in the UK or that Lyme, you can't have Lyme disease because you haven't been to the new forest. Um, so get everybody on the same wavelength if you can. The toolkit's available, there's an e-learning module. Apparently it was easily accessed before. You now I think have to log on 24 hours in advance, but it still should be free to, to all clinicians, pharmacists, nurses. Think about doing a practice audit. How many cases have you had actually in the last five years? How did you manage them? Um, and follow that through in the, in the longer term to see that everyone is on the same page. And patients aren't getting sent away being told chronic Lyme disease doesn't exist and they're imagining their symptoms. Um, Lyme Disease Awareness Month is May. Although patients won't be sitting in your waiting room, maybe you could think about whether to put something on the, the website, on your practice website. There's lots and lots of links to the different patient groups um, and leaflets and posters. Um, and those are a couple of the um, uh, links to the toolkit, to the e-learning, to NICE and the Lyme Resource Centre. So thank you very much for listening. Um, and that's the end of my presentation. <laughs>